in our topic, and each one of us, for the most part, will respond to each question in order. And I think we'll begin with the very first question. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay. What do we mean by critical in terms of literacies and citizenship practices? How does this idea compare or contrast across Brazilian and Canadian settings? And I guess we'll start with uh, Andrea. Yeah, well, I hate that my name begins with an A. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, it seems that I'll be the first one to talk all the time. But we can anyway. start from the bottom. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. Next time. All right. Um, I'll try to be short <coughs> as uh, we don't have much time and we are many to speak. But um, I like the idea that Langshear and Mark Lyon um, put forward saying that becoming critical must be based on a reflection that is consciously guided by the intention to change understanding of the world and in the same process to change that very world we inhabit and are trying to understand. So this, this, this is what I'm trying to use in my um, language classes at undergraduate level at my institution and also in my language teacher education courses, mostly at uh, postgraduate level, um, what we call the diploma um, course or specialization. Is that what you, you say in, in, in Canada or in, in English? for teacher education. Yeah, it, it's a postgraduate program that uh, you, you don't really need uh, a great uh, undergraduate program um, certificate in, in teaching, but it allows you to teach in certain, how do you say that, Valkyria? Is it, it like diploma? additional qualifications that we would yeah. call in Ontario, yeah. where you, that's, that's you area, take yeah. certain yeah. kinds of courses that allow you to teach certain field areas? Yeah, like right. additional qualifications in Ontario. Okay. So, um, so uh, I take this. Uh, I take critical literacy to be these practices, uh, this intention uh, to see things from different perspectives, different points of view. Okay, just like. Paulo Freire said, read, to read the world, the word and the world behind it. Um, so um, <coughs> what I'm trying to do is uh, really give some examples of what I've been doing lately after I finished the PhD. So one of, of, um, of the, the examples that I have, can you put the next sure. slide please? This, this example comes from um, one of my participants, te teacher, English teacher participants in my PhD research. She devised uh, some activities to use with her students in a, high school, a public high school in Belo Horizonte, my, my city in Brazil. Um, one of, of these activities was based on a website, uh, a mobile phone website. Uh, so students were supposed to read the the website page, and um, they they had several activities, oral activities, listening activities, and then in in the end they had to produce. They were supposed to uh, to imagine that they had bought a mobile phone on any website, and that when they got the mobile phone, it was defective. In, in any way, so it was not working for some reason, and they had to complain to the manufacturer. So they were supposed to write a letter of complaint. So uh, this was, in fact, Brian's idea that I should talk about this activity specifically because his students have been reading um, a paper that I wrote, and, and then their reaction was the reaction that I first found uh, when I first presented this work in 2009, in, when I was here in Canada for my PhD sandwich, and I first presented this letter of complaint, and one person in the audience raised his hand and said, okay, but why is this critical? And, and then this made me think of the Brazilian situation. Uh, at the time, I think I didn't have an answer yet, because for me, it seemed critical. 
um, in my in my context. But once he asked, um, it made it started me thinking about the reasons why I thought that was critical. And the reason is that in Brazil, Brazilians here already know about it. We've gone through uh, some time of political domination uh, during the military government after 1964. And during this time, people were not really allowed to complain about anything. So um, people who lived during this time, I really don't remember much of that as I was a small baby. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I remember certain things, uh, and, and then I, I think that people who lived during this time did not learn to complain. And some of these people went on to, to teaching careers, and they have reproduced this, this, um, this culture of not complaining. Um, and also, in, in terms of the young generation nowadays, they <coughs> frequently meet with, either, either in their communities or in, in the schools, they meet with people who come from this past generation. So these kind of conformist views and cultures of not complaining is passing on from generation to de generation. So this activity, in my view, is one possibility of having students practice certain kinds of uh, situations that they may face in real life, but that they can practice in, in a safe environment in, in the language classroom. So uh, just this, okay. this is just one example. Uh, I guess this is the answer for the first no, question. Okay, do I go to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Um, Lena. Question number two or more? Oh, we're, oh, sorry, we're still on number two. Oh, number one, sorry. There we are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, before anything, I'd like to, to thank you for listening to us. Thank you for, thanks Diana for the opportunity to be here today. And for, well, I'm Lena. <laughs> I am, I am a, a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo under the supervision of Professor Valkyrie Montemor. And, okay, let's see. So, we are trying to understand what we mean by critical. And uh, I've written some words to try to answer or to make some comments on this question. And uh, as I am focused on uh, teacher education, mainly pre-service teacher education, my comments on this question are related to the need of working on providing teachers to be with opportun opportunities to challenge their own beliefs and truths so that it becomes possible for them to fight back what I've, I've been calling the forces to, uh, that prevent them from being respected and valued as professionals. That's my concern. So in Brazil, because teaching is believed to be an under undervalued profession, both socially and economically, teachers to be tend to give up the career even before uh, really going into, into the career. So, besides low salaries and low social value, negative feedback from in-service teachers and difficult everyday working conditions are pointed out as the main reasons for career dropout. So, main in-service teachers usually make comments uh, about the career, about negative aspects of the career, so that demotivates teachers to be to uh, really enter the career. So in this context, I see critical as related to questions of identity and power, to the understand, understanding of each one's position and roles in society, the ability to understand these courses, where they come from, who makes them, and why. And at the same time, the ability to produce counter discourses and fight back the forces that insist on silencing them. Uh, Professor Brydens points out the, uh, an idea of citizenship that, that helps me to understand what I mean here. Uh, she understands citizenship as people having the possibility to make choices about how they want to live. The possibility and the capacity to participate, <coughs> that is, to understand their own rights and have the chance to and know how to practice them. But I think we have to learn how to do it. That's the point. 
So uh, student teachers need to be provided with chances to unlearn the understanding of the world that the one Andrea was talking about and learn new ways of seeing it or reinterpreting it. And as teacher educators, we in Brazil also need the, that chance very badly, I think. So that's my idea of critical. Okay. okay. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Diana, Ian, and Brian for the invitation, and uh, thank you for, while in Brazil, observing the, my students' presentation, and that's why I guess that the, the invitation came from, right? To, to talk a little bit about what I do there, and I'm from uh, Universidade Federal de Alagoas, Alagoas Federal University in Brazil. Well, um, so as not to be repetitive, so I would say that uh, I agree with what uh, Andrea and uh, Nina mentioned about critical, but my emphasis is basically um, making my students um, see different possibilities, different interpretations of, uh, of a given text, right? And basically, so I will try to, to show and save some time for my uh, practice with my, what I do with my students, so later in the, on the fifth question. So basically that's what I understand by critical. Hi, my name is Christine, and uh, I'm a, also a PhD candidate, and Brian Morgan, Professor Morgan is my supervisor. And uh, at the same time, I, I also teach in a LINK program, and for those of you who don't know what LINK is, it's a government-funded program for adult immigrants. So that's where my focus is, is uh, looking critically uh, with adult and e ESL immigrants in Canada. I took uh, two definitions from uh, a couple of books about what I think critical is. And <coughs> generally it's about understanding and I think you guys talked about it too, but transforming as well. So the first definition I have is from Hawkins and Norton's book. And it's a focus on how dominant ideologies in society drive the construction of understandings and meanings in ways that privilege certain groups of people while marginalizing others. So that's what I look at. And then the transformation uh, aspect is defined here too by Kenegaraja. And he states that critical students and teachers are prepared to situate learning in the relevant social context, unravel the implications of power and pedagogy pedagogical activity and commit themselves to transforming the means and ends of learning in order to construct more egalitarian, equitable, and ethical educational and social environments. So I'm fo I, I would like to uh, focus on changing society so it's more equal. <laughs> um. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about what I think are four priorities and I do uh, language teacher ed around the notion of the critical and I, I think of it as in four domains, four political domains. So a, a politics of knowledge, um, whose ways of knowing or epistemologies are, are um, given priority in the curriculum, what are other ways of knowing that are not in the curriculum and I'm reminded of earlier presentations today about that. Um, also, getting back to something Andrea said a little earlier about how, especially a difference between a Brazilian and a, and, well, certainly can, in the Canadian context, a very high immigrant context, uh, newcomers are an incredible resource rather than deficit of uncommon sense. And so this idea in, in a classroom using students' ways of knowing to challenge these kinds of habituated ways of thinking about texts maybe passively, for example. So in the ESL context, ways of knowing what are the resources at hand. A second one is, is the issue of language. Uh, so a politics of language, uh, emphasis on language as a social practice, rather than something neutral, something that always shapes social futures. Um, Roger Simon uses the term, uh, the late Roger Simon, who was on my thesis committee, passed away last month, and he used to talk about horizons of possibility. 
and uh, in terms of again of knowledge and language. A politics of identity is, is another idea that I, I talk about or try to convey in language teacher ed. This, this idea that identities are not given or fixed, that they're contested and they change across time and place including language classrooms and students need to be aware of that. Uh, the last group was talking about the complexities of identity around multiple semiotic, multimodal, multiliteracies. And then a politics of pedagogy that the students know that language, language teaching also involves and can involve addressing power relations, inequalities, and difference. And that it's important for students to think about the kinds of teacher-student relationships and identities that are negotiated in classrooms. And one of the key issues also related to this is, is that critical work also has to be ethical and dialogic. And I was reminded of what Jamil said today. She, she put it, uh, is she here? She had a really nice way of describing how there must be an openness or a willingness to change one's prior beliefs as an outcome of interaction with others. And that I think that's a key idea of critical teaching that is ethical is the always the possibility of being open to new ways to conceptualize the critical in different contexts. So those are kind of the things I try to convey in language teacher ed around critical work. Um, let's go on to the next one. I guess I'm going next now. <laughs> Catch my breath. Okay, so what are the similarities and differences in the relationship between citizenship and English language teaching in a second language setting compared to foreign language settings such as Brazil? I'm going to speak to one, one quick issues that I know Christine talks about is that in Canada there's very much the notion of stages of development around citizenship. So um, I've been involved in a couple of national curricula documents, uh, LINK documents as a consultant and advisor and there's always the, the, the notion all, again what John was talking about of a monolingual assumption that you're not ready to talk about serious things until you're stage four. That the learner is infantilized and incapable of meaningful engagement with content until stages that are usually not funded by link by the way. So one of the interesting things is this strong assumption of stages of development that critical literacies or citizenship work cannot be done until a very so-called higher order advanced stage. In my experience in the classroom, that is never the case. The students surprise me even at level one with things that will say that are clearly about their place in the, in the world and in the country at that time. So that's one of the issues. The other one that I think relates to John's talk about um, the, the status of the native English speaking teacher, and this came up in my class this week, was that the, the, the assumption of being the best model of the target language carries sometimes, especially for the untrained BA in you know, liberal arts who's suddenly been hired in Korea, the assumption that they are, they are also the expert on what citizenship means. And I used to see this in China when I was teaching in the 80s. And there's the assumption that, that my notion of democracy and freedom are somehow universal and that the native English speaking teacher quite often goes around the world carrying these kind of notions of this is a one size fits all notion of what counts as good citizenship teaching, uh, what counts as freedom and democracy. And again, it fails to engage with what Andrea was engaging with with that ad. What are the specific situated historical reasons for critical work. Can I turn Is that over my Yep. So I wanted to talk about uh, language learning in, in a Canadian context. And uh, one of the things that is required for uh, to become a Canadian citizen if, um, is to pass a citizenship test. And to, as of November 1st, there's a, an additional requirement where uh, applicants have to prove language proficiency to a uh, CLB4, Canadian Language Benchmarks 4, which I'm not sure if you're yeah, familiar with. Right. Yeah, the Ryan's paper. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, if you want, I can pass around the study guide that uh, applicants have to um, read 
memorize and take a multiple choice question. And that's <laughs> basically how they gain knowledge about Canada. And I'm going to talk about that more in another question. But if you want, I can pass them around and you can just browse through them. Sure. Yeah. Just like study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There'll be a test at the end of this. Okay? Yeah. So I think multiple that choice. Yeah. So I think that there's uh, there there's different <coughs> pressures in a in a Brazilian context, but in the Canadian context, there's you have to learn English a specific way for a specific reason if you want to become a Canadian citizen. So that's what I wanted to say with that one. Okay, so uh, I guess in this question, um, me and Lena, we shared because uh, there were two points, like the policy and pedagogy. So I'll be talking a little bit about policy, and Lena will talk more about pedagogy, right? So um, what we discussed was that Brazil, you know, Brazil is this very big country, right? Um, and because of this, we have several policies. Um, but since the 1988 Brazilian Constitution, the state and city governments earned some responsibility to devise public policies, including educational policies, such as linguistic policies, for example. Um, they, are, they were also granted the freedom to devise local specific policies, that is, policies created specifically to the local necessities. So in, in Specific states, they have specific policies focusing on um, local necessities. But national policies still come up every day. So there, is, there, are, there are lots of policies, doc official documents that teachers are supposed to read and understand. But of course, we know this doesn't always happen. Um, one point that I want to mention, which is I was very much interested in this question because um, although I've come to Canada a few times, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we don't really get to know about these things when we are visiting, right? So I was curious about the, the situation in Canada and I, I read your paper and that's how I understand what you're talking about. But in Brazil, in my view, it seems that these policies tend to concentrate on what policymakers understand as being the learner's necessities or the student's necessities. Um, so as far as my own interpretation of these policies goes, they tend to view learner's necessities in, in two possible ways, either in terms of reading comprehension, restricted focus on reading comprehension to, to pass vestibular, which is our university entrance examination, uh, or in terms of international contact with either native or non-native speakers of English for, for business, um, so in terms of English as a <coughs> lingua franca, okay? Um, and I'm not really sure, um, as I was listening to Samara, where is she? Oh. Um, yes, I was, uh, before that, I was already thinking, that I'm, I'm not really sure if these policies really meet students' needs. And as Samara was presenting today, it seems that students um, tend to need different things than um, policymakers suppose, right? So uh, this is uh, what I have to say about this question so far. Lena will <coughs> follow up with some other ideas. Yeah, and, and um, considering what Andrea has just said, so we have this situation of uh, uh, grammar-focused lessons uh, in, in public schools, in elementary and high schools in Brazil, but not only in public high schools, I mean also in private high schools. But the, uh, the question is that uh, there is this belief that in uh, private uh, schools, uh, students have more chances to learn uh, to speak the language than in, uh, in um, public schools in Brazil. So we are grammar focused and uh, there is also this belief that language is dissociated, as, as Samara said, from culture. So that's another problem we have also. And uh, because of that, it's, it's very hard uh, to uh, implement uh, um, practices of uh, critical literacy in the schools because teachers, they, they understand that uh, 
the first point is to learn the language, as Brian said before. So uh, the point is, first of all, you need to develop your skills, your, your language skills or your uh, communicative uh, competence or linguistic competence before you can discuss anything or you can uh, work on critical uh, procedures or practices. So I think that's <coughs> the most, uh, the two points I'd like to emphasize here. Language is seen as, as neutral, as dissociated from, from culture and this grammar-based lessons and pedagogy we have in Brazil. Okay, so I, I guess what uh, I have to add on, the, um, on, on that topic is that uh, depending on the schools for private institutions, um, so like um, uh, John mentioned, I guess being a native speaker is okay, so you can get a, a job at, a, at an institution. But uh, in, in public, you need a certification you need to go to. Uh, but then uh, what's happening, at least in, in Alagoas, I guess in most uh, states in Brazil, that even if you are uh, an undergraduate student on the first year, you can start teaching because, as mentioned earlier, so nobody wants to be a teacher, right? So if you are a university student, you can get a job. You, you, you are called in Alagoas like uh, a monitor and you start teaching English, Portuguese, geography. And um, so just to put some uh, arguments on, the, on, the, on what Andrea mentioned, I guess, for example, the, 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 the official documents that we have for languages, modern languages, I guess it can be interpreted also, in my point of view, in, in a different way. I, I, I think uh, it gives um, <coughs> a certain, so we are free in a way to, to, to work not only with the language itself, but also to, to, to make students uh, think and become active citizens. I think, uh, well, the way I understand, I read the, the official documents are on this line. So uh, it's not uh, uh, strict that you have to teach the language just to the, the, the four skills and that's it. I think it goes beyond. Uh, uh, that's the way I read the the, the official documents. Okay. Okay. Oh, that was your example. Well, you can Question three. Your example is also after this. Okay. So every time we have okay. a new example, is there. sorry. Okay. Should we start with you, Andrea? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, you, you so what do each of us see as sources of resistance and or ambivalence to critical literacies and pedagogies in language teacher education? Okay. Uh, well, again, um, I'm, I'm going to give an example from my own uh, experience. Uh, first, I, I would just like to say that um, <coughs> the first example that I gave is, has been just published in, in this book in a paper that I, I was able to include here. So if you're interested, I'll be happy to share. Um, but, well, this, this was, uh, well, what I have experienced as one possible source of resistance. Uh, I think we don't have time to mention all possible sources, but this is one that um, has struck me in some way. <laughs> so, um, to, uh, resistance to critical literacies and pedagogies in language teacher education and in language, uh, in language teaching, only, not only in language teacher education, but also in language teaching, uh, is this perceived notion, a mainstream notion, that the school is, n is a neutral institution, as Lena was saying, that it is possible to teach English in a neutral way, uh, way, only through grammar. So if you concentrate on grammar, you are being neutral or not, right? Uh, so parents, teachers, and students themselves still conceptualize the school as instructionally neutral. That is, the school is supposed to teach, not to educate, if you can understand what I mean. So the, 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 the school would be more uh, should be more focused on content, and the family would 
um, teach the values, okay? So it's not, not the, the role of the school to teach values. That, that's what I mean by being neutral, okay? Um, this, again, may be related to the military government that I have mentioned in, in the beginning, because during the military government, any, anything people said could be considered subversive, and people were arrested for that. Um, so uh, politicians, songwriters, artists, and educators, Caetano Veloso, I don't know if, if you're familiar with these names, but some famous names are Caetano Veloso, Chico Buarque, and Paulo Freire also. Um, so uh, these, some of these people had to leave the country to save their lives, and many other people were not so lucky. So um, one thing that happened, uh, last semester when I went back to teaching because I had a four-year leave for my PhD research. So when I returned to teaching, we had um, a short course and several teachers were teaching the same course together. So on my, on my day, of course, I was um, presenting on critical literacy. What it, it was a, a, a course for undergraduate students preparing, preparing to become teachers, English teachers. Uh, so I presented about critical literacy and how to use it in the classroom. Um, and one student said that what I was proposing was brainwashing. And I answered that, well, that's, that's what school has done our whole life. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just uh, proposing a different type of brainwashing, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I, that, 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 that's what I mean. Teachers and students themselves, they, they resist the idea of, of um, bringing to the classroom more critical views of, of anything, of language, of culture, of topics in general. Um, and I guess this is because, because of these, uh, this mainstream notion that the school should be neutral and concentrate on con content and not on values. Okay, I'll give some examples in question five. Yeah, I think besides that, there is also the problem that uh, for, in Brazil, for you to become a language teacher, so you, uh, it's not necessary that you really speak the language you intend to teach. So that's something very uh, serious. So if I decided to become a German teacher today, in four years, if I go to school today, in four years I leave the school as a German teacher. So I'm going to learn German during these four years so that I can teach German uh, in the future. You know? So it's, it's a problem because uh, uh, s um, people who work at, on teacher education, they believe that first of all we need to master the language. So we are, again, focused on teaching the language. So if a language is, is believed to be dissociated from, from culture, so we are going to, again, have uh, the focus on communicative competence and mostly linguistic competence. So that's, that's a problem. And uh, another uh, source of resistance I see is the problem that uh, most of my colleagues don't see themselves as teacher educators. So they are linguists, they are applied linguists, but they are not teacher educators. So they are not really concerned uh, about uh, what school means or what uh, their <coughs> students are going to become, the fact that their students are going to become teachers. So it's another problem because they are focused again on content and not on uh, what we are going how, how we are going to implement the, this knowledge in becoming teachers in the school. So that's another problem I see. So I interpret the, the, the question as um, thinking of my students. So most of them complain that uh, the theories we read uh, don't match with their realities. So this is, and I wouldn't call them so resistance, but challenges for, for myself. And then, um, so, what do I have to do? So critical literacy, so that's another challenge. Can I uh, teach English and also using critical literacy? So that's one of them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Then that's um, 
what's been questioning us from, from the national project. So uh, is it possible to teach English while teaching uh, critical literacy? So these are the two. So focus on, on, on the students, besides, of course, what Lena said, that most of our colleagues think that just because they are linguists, etc., they only have to teach the content and not really educate the, the, the future teachers. Okay, I want to address this question <coughs> with uh, a book I read called Rethinking Frere uh, by Bowers and Apfel Maglin. And uh, in, in this, uh, oh, okay. So uh, Bowers uh, talks about how uh, Frere's uh, pedagogy is based on Western assumptions that undermine indigenous knowledge systems and that he, um, Frere had an emphasis on critical reflection as the only source of knowledge and on the need to overturn all traditions and also that they're universal, universally valid. And one of the uh, uh, contribu contributors to this uh, book was uh, Phyllis Robinson and she talks about her experience going to Cambodia and working with uh, Cambodian nuns and uh, some other young women who were uh, being trained uh, as counselors with Western style approaches. And she thought it would be a good idea for the nuns with their experience to exchange knowledge with uh, these young women. But the nuns were reluct reluctant to share their knowledge and she made the conclusion that these nuns were oppressed and they didn't value their knowledge, but they, uh, in their belief system, they didn't feel that they should be sharing their knowledge because um, knowledge is a gift given to some based on merit making in past lives. So I, I can't even begin to explain this idea because I don't know. Uh, it's. Um, I think uh, in Buddhism um, idea, ideology, but after some consideration she, she understood it a bit better and just made this criticism <coughs> about um, critical pedagogy and I think it, it's kind of interesting that how we think we know how to do uh, empowerment and not consider other types of knowledge as valuable. That there makes me think about this idea of the, the, the confessional modes of learning people are you know, uh, in powerless positions or less powerful positions. You know that giving knowledge to the anthropologist or the researcher creates you know, new forms of dependency or expert interventions. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I'm going to go back to just a couple, couple other things in uh, language teacher ad. Um, and, uh, some of the panelists have also referred to some of these ideas of the neutrality objecti objectivity assumed uh, in teaching. But also, uh, I, I have students think that it's, they have to choose that either they are a critical pedagogue or literacy teacher or they're a neutral one. So they see it as it's got to be all or nothing rather than conceptualizing that it may be critical moments that you not necessarily have to choose either or. Uh, and also the zero sum proposition, the, that you you time spent on critical work takes time away from more important uh, uh, curricular content. And instead of telling teachers that in fact you can think about ways in which grammar and critical literacies become integrated, in fact enriched. And I think uh, one of my favorite scholars is Hilary Jenks, who always talks about that. That grammatical awareness is ha enhanced by understanding of language and power, and the way particular forms position the viewer in a multimodal sense, or the, the reader, to understand and enriches the students' need to learn, or desire to learn grammars. So this idea that you have to choose either, or you're taking time away, I disagree with. Um, and, and I agree with, uh, I think people in critical uh, pedagogy, who do critical work sometimes, we are our own worst enemies in the fields of language teacher education. Many of the texts deal with abstract theory. They don't engage in the ways in which I think teachers remember 
episodically through through particular experiences they don't engage with the kinds of narrativized ways texts are produced in, in often teacher content so that becomes a problem um, and one of the other things that one of my students once said to me after reading uh, several articles on linguistic genocide and linguistic imperialism said Gee, I don't think I want to be a teacher anymore, Brian. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, and this is one of my best students. I, this is several years ago, I thought, okay. And I realized that, you know, there has to be a Paulo Freire, there has to be a pedagogy of hope besides the, the work that often did the, the revelation of despair and power. So that's another thing. There can be an emphasis on a lot of negativity in critical work. And I have to keep reminding students why I love teaching and why I love being with students. So. That becomes the thing. And then the last point um, is the overwhelming expectations of teachers doing it on their own. Like the great movie Stand and Deliver, where the teacher, teacher single-handedly goes into the worst neighborhood under, <laughs> underfunded, violent, drug neighborhood, and single-handedly it's Superman. And it's a guy, of course. He changes everything and everyone's empowered. So, the policymakers, if we talk too much about teacher empowerment, there is this assumption that the, the governments don't have to do anything anymore, and the governments say, oh, you didn't empower your students enough. So that's the other thing about critical work with, with working with teachers is, is to be aware of what you can do, be aware of uh, very large, powerful institutions and decisions that you have smaller amounts of wiggle room on that one. Okay. Uh, Let's go to number four. And maybe we'll ask Lynn Mario to add something in number four. I didn't warn him about this, of course. Um, I think some, some of the members of the group <laughs> didn't want to talk about this. Um, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, I guess I'll start with John was speaking earlier about Korea, and I actually was the uh, supervisor of John's wife, Ki Jin, and she wrote a very interesting uh, master's research paper on the analysis of official textbooks around English. And it's funny in this global context how English has become the default language of becoming the privileged participant as a global citizen. And her, her textbook analysis were so interesting because she looked at what al aspects of Korean society were being, were being presented through English as you are now the Korean global citizen, this is how you should present us to the world. So okay. it was really interesting to see. Could you read the question for the... Oh, sorry. What are some of the tensions for curricula policy between nation state and global citizenship practices and identity negotiation? And this is, this is just a comment on as it, the power of, of English as this global lingua franca that in many countries the assumption is that you learn English for these very kinds of instrumental tasks of speaking to the world about who your country is and what they aspire to to be participants on this global stage and He Jin's work was so interesting because she started to look at the selective presentation of who we are as Koreans through the medium of English through the textbooks, which aspects of diversity were um, subordinated or marginalized, or not even mentioned in the text. Which values, this is the other thing, who gets to name the values that we should aspire to as, as uh, citizens of the world, as Obama said in Berlin, I had a student bring that in. So these are some of the complexities of who gets, who gets to speak, who gets access to the, lang to the language of being heard on a global stage, and, and whose voices and whose uncommon practices are ignored in the, in the construction of the common good in these factors. And those are some, I think, some of the things that don't get taken up in nation state citizenship. I want to talk about uh, <coughs> what it means to be Canadian and to uh, immigrants wanting to be Canadian citizens. And the book that I passed around, the study guide, is, uh, like I said before, is uh, applicants have to uh, study the book and take a test in order to pass. 
So um, Trevor Gulliver uh, wrote an article about this and he um, used uh, concordance software, which I've never used, but basically what you do is you type in a word and it, in a body of text and it come, that word comes up every time and then you can um, make an analysis out of that. So he took the word Canadian out of the text that I handed around and he uh, discovered that this is, according to that text, what Canadians value and it's diversity, equality, hard work, war, the Queen, and my favorite, hockey. <laughs> and uh, this is what it is to be Canadian. And um, he uh, invites us to reimagine that and to discuss that differently because um, there's, a, a, there's other interests in play there and he wants us to uh, consider the powerful, uh, what powerful interests are being played in these uh, texts. Um, also, I wanted to talk about this notion of Canadian and as, a, as an ESL teacher in Canada, the, the books that we have to teach English because we don't have a lot of planning time and we uh, rely heavily on text to, to teach in our classrooms. And one of the books that we use a lot is called Canadian Concepts. And any link teacher will know that book. They'll be like, oh yeah, I know I use Canadian Concepts in my classroom. And uh, Eliva did a study on uh, this book, and she found out uh, she did in her analysis. She uh, reports that a lot of space was given in this text for shopping. So it, there's this notion that Canadians love to shop, and shopping is very important in Canada. And not only is it important. The way we shop is, there's a certain way all Canadians shop, so we um, buy things on sale, we look for sales, we buy things on sale, uh, we wait for bargains, and you know, coming out of this, she, she kind of asks, uh, lets us <coughs> think about you know, other ways of shopping, if you want to talk about shopping, that maybe not be for the person who has a low income who can't wait for sales and who can't, maybe they need to go to secondhand stores to buy. And these aren't addressed in these texts. Never mind the fact that shopping is fun, but it's not a big part of, you know, our culture, perhaps. <laughs> so so these, I, uh, these ways that we kind of identify to Canadian and how we teach it in the classroom is very interesting and we need to question Anything you want to add to this? Brazilians and Canadians have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you'd like to add to this?